I'm here to revise you on thesis questions for WAEC and NECO. And the topic I have this day is capacitors and capacitance. Now the question is, what is a capacitor? A capacitor is simply a device used for storing charges or electricity. A capacitor is made up of two parallel conductors or plates separated by a distance. And that distance could be, that separation could be a dielectric. A dielectric is an insulator or a material that, is, that has poor conductor. Now, the charge stored in a capacitor Q is directly proportional to the this potential difference between the plates. Now, mathematically, you write it as Q directly proportional to V. And of course, removing the sign of proportionality, Q will be equal to CV, where C is a constant of proportionality called capacitance. And that brings us to what is a capacitance. A capacitance is the ratio of the charge Produce on either plate of the capacitor to the potential difference between them. Like I said, that the charge produced in the capacitor is directly proportional to the potential difference between the two parallel plates acting as terminals, where Q is directly proportional to V. Removing the sign of proportionality, you have Q equal to CV where C is a constant of proportionality called capacitance. Now, what is capacitance? Or what is the capacitance of a capacitor? Now, the capacitance of a capacitor is the ratio of the charge Q stored on either plate or conductor to the potential difference V between the plates. So mathematically, from that formula, previous formula of Q equal to CV, you make C, which is the capacitance subject of the formula, and when you make C subject of the formula, you have Q all over V. The SI unit of capacitor is in farad. Now, the unit is very, very key because in physics, units are very, very important, so you must take note of every unit. Now, we have, that's the SI unit, we have other units other units could include microfarad, nanofarad, and picofarad. But when you are given any question under this other unit, you have to convert to the SI unit, which is in farad. So for instance, you are given one microfarad. In converting to farad, you multiply by 10 raised to power minus 6. So one microfarad is equivalent to 10 raised to power minus 6 farad why one nanofarad is equivalent to 10 raised to power minus nine farad. So also one picofarad is equivalent to 10 raised to power minus 12 farad. Right, now there are, other, there are some factors that affect the capacitance of a capacitor. We have three factors that affect the capacitance of a capacitor. We have one, the surface area of overlap, of the parallel plate. We have the second one at the distance between the plate, the distance D between the plate, and the third one, the permittivity or nature of dielectric material. Now, how does the surface area affect the capacitance? As the area increases, the capacitance also increases. So the form of dependence is a direct proportionality where C is directly proportional to A. Distance D between the plate, as the distance increases, the capacitance decreases. In other words, the form of dependence is an inverse proportionality. So C is inversely proportional to 1 over D, while the third one is a direct proportionality. Now, these factors can be represented mathematically. And how do we write that? C, which is directly proportional to A. Remember I said the factor 
one, which is the surface area of overlap, is a direct proportionality. So C is directly proportional to A and inversely proportional to D. Remember, the distance between the plates is an inverse proportionality. That's why we have D coming under A. Now, removing the sign of proportionality, we now have C equal to S talon, which is written like E, S talon A all over D. That S talon is the uh, constant of a, is a constant known as permittivity of material between the plates. So if you look at that permittivity of material between the plate, is that third factor there that talks about permittivity or nature of the dielectric? Why A is the area and D is the distance? Of course, the units are all there. Area is in meter squared. D distance is meter and the permittivity also is there. Now, having known all of this, we want to see how capacitors are being arranged. Capacitors are arranged in two ways. One series and the other one parallel. Now, when we talk about series arrangement, that's one, they are arranged in a straight line, one end to another. It could be two or three capacitors or even more arranged in series. Now, when capacitors are arranged in series, Take note of this because it's very important because when you want to apply it in solving, in calculations, you need to know all of this. Now when capacitors are arranged in series, the same charge is established. Remember we said a capacitor is a device for storing charges. So when they are arranged in series, the same charge is established, but the potential difference between them or across each of the capacitors is different. Now. The equivalent capacitance or the total or the effective capacitance of a capacitor in series or capacitors arranged in series is equivalent to C, that's 1 over C is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3 plus as the case may be, that means it could be more than one. But remember, we are looking for C. So at the end of the day, after your calculation, you make C the subject of the formula, not necessarily 1 over C now. So C will not be equal to whatever the, the answer or the formula when you are solving. All right? But the PD, that the voltage across the, this arrangement, like I said, is different. So how do you get the total voltage? The total voltage is equivalent to the sum of the individual voltages, like V1, V equal to V1 plus V2 plus V3, as the case may be. But if they are more than that or less than that, if you just took uh, uh, capacitors, you end at V1 and V2 and so on. But remember, V from our formula, previous formula, we said Q is equal to CV. So make it V subject of the formula discover that V is equal to Q over C. So if V is equal to Q over C, it means that going back to the formula of the voltage V equal to V1, it means that V1 is equal to Q over C1. Why V2 is equal to Q over C2 and V3 is also equal to Q over C3. Now take note, the Q is the same because the same charge is established here. All right. Now, for, for some special cases, or for a special case, if the capacitors are arranged in series is just two, then you can use this, same, this other formula to get the, the, the effective capacitor, which is C equal to the product of the capacitors over the sum of the capacitor. So in case, when there are two. So C will now be C1 C2 all over C1 plus C2. That's for a special case like that. All right, moving on. Capacitors, the parallel arrangement of capacitor. Like I said, the first one, they are arranged like that. The second one, parallel, they are arranged in parallel. You know what I mean when you say parallel. So when capacitors are arranged in parallel, take note from the four, previous one of series. When capacitors are arranged in parallel, this time around, the charge that is established is not the same, unlike series. 
But the voltage across them is the same. The voltage is the same, the charge is different. In series, charge established is the same, the PD is different. But in this case, the PD is the same, the same voltage is established, but the charges are different. So in other words, the effective capacitance or the total capacitance in this case is equivalent to the sum of the individual capacitors. That is C equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. Then the charge is given by Q, that's the total charge, Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. Remember the charges established on each capacitor is different. But from our previous formula that says Q is equal to CV, it means that Q1 is equal to C1V, Q2 is C2V, and Q3 is C3V. So putting this back into the formula of the effective uh, charge, Q, you now have Q as C1V1 plus C2V, C1V plus C2V plus C3V. All right, so that is that for the arrangement of capacitors. Now, energy stored in a capacitor. Now, the energy stored in a capacitor is the energy, the work done in a capacitor is the energy stored in that uh, capacitor. Now, E, mathematically, E, which is energy, is equal to the work done, which is W, and is equal to 1 over 2 QV. Now, if we take that as uh, equation 1, we know that from the previous formulas that we have done, we said Q is equal to C is equal to Q over V. So if uh, C is equal to Q over V, and from that you make V subject of the formula, you have Q over C if you make V subject of the formula. Now, we take that as equation 2. If you put this formula, equation 2, into equation 1 of E equal to 1 over 2 QV, that equation becomes 1 over 2 Q squared C, or Q squared all over 2C. In other words, we can still use another formula which says if Q is CV, if you substitute Q equal to CV into that first equation, the, the formula becomes E equal to CV squared all over 2. All of these formulas, they are necessary when solving questions on that capacitor. So it depends on how the question is set, you know which of the formula to apply. All right? Now, we take some uses of capacitors. Capacitors, they have some uses. Now, one of the, use of, or the uses of capacitor, like we said, it is used to store electric uh, charges or energy. Now, another use is that it can be used to control current in an alternating current, which is AC. It can also be used to separate alternating current from direct current, that's AC from DC. It can be used also to reduce fluctuations, voltage fluctuations, and it can also be used in ignition system in, of uh, motor vehicles. Also, it can be used in radio circuits for tuning. We have other uses. Now, having known all of this, we want to take some examples in uh, concerning capacitors and capacitance. So we have to apply, you know, physics is all about knowing the concept, the formula, the physics behind it, and applying the, 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 the formula. So we want to take some examples so that we can understand all of what I have said earlier on. Now, if the diagram below, there's a diagram, okay, the diagram below represents a section, we take it bit by bit. The diagram below represents a section of a circuit, and the question says, calculate the effective capacitance in the section. Now, looking at the diagram, it's a diagram that comprises of a capacitor in series and combined to two other capacitors in parallel. Now, when you have a situation like this, what do you do? First and foremost, first and foremost, now I have to say this because calculation, when you are taking calculations or solving questions in physics, the physics of the question is very, very key. In other words, first and foremost, understand the question. 
If you understand the question, then you'll be able to apply the formula. So in solving question under physics, in physics, the first thing you do is to write the physics of the, form, uh, of the question, which is the formula. Now looking at this question, for instance, we have to resolve that capacitor, the two capacitors in parallel, so that they can become in series, they become in series with the other capacitor that has 40 microfarad. So how do you resolve the capacitors in series? Then going back toward the formula or the effective capacitance of capacitors in series, all you need to do, you have to add that C, the formula is C equal to C1 plus C2. Now we're using C1 plus C2 here because it's just two capacitors in series. They are not up to three. So C1 plus C2. Now C1 is 20 microfarad and C2 is also 20 microfarad. So what do you do? You add them together. The sum of the individual capacitors in parallel. So if you add C1 and C2, you have 40 microfarad. Then that 40 microfarad is now in series with the former uh, capacitor, which is 40 microfarad also. Now the question is, calculate the effective capacitance in this section. So we want to know the effective capacitance in this section. So the effective capacitance, like we said, is 1 over C equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. I'm ending at C2 here because the, the, the capacitors in series here now is just 2. So C1 is 40, C2 is also 40. So 1 over 40 plus 1 over 40. What do you do? You look for the LCM of both of them. The LCM is 40, and when you resolve, you, you have a 2 over 40. That gives us 40 over 2 over 40. That's 1 over C is equal to 2 over 40. Remember, we're looking for C and not 1 over C. So when you make C subject of the formula, you now have 40 all over 2, which gives us 20 microfarad. Now, in this case, too, you can apply this other formula that says C equal to the product and product over the sum, which is the product of the capacitor 40 times 40 all over 40 plus 40 to still give you the same answer as 20 microfarad. More questions from past questions. Another question says, a series arrangement of three capacitors of values 8 microfarad, 12 microfarad, and 24 microfarad is connected in series with a 90 volt battery. First question draw an open circuit diagram for this arrangement. Draw an open circuit diagram. Two, calculate the effective capacitance in the circuit. Then three, on closed circuit, calculate the charge on each capacitor when fully charged. Then the last question says, determine the potential difference across the eight microfarad capacitor. Now, like I said, this is a question before us. When you want to tackle this kind of question in the exam, study the question, understand the question. Now, and don't try to jump one, from one to another. Follow it serially. Now the first instruction here says draw an open circuit diagram. So you have to draw the diagram. What is the diagram? We're told that three capacitors are arranged in series. Now we have earlier, you know, show, have earlier shown you how to draw capacitors in series. So you have to draw the capacitor in series, 8 microfarad in series with 12 and also with uh, 24 connected to a 90 volt battery. Remember, they said the question says an open circuit. So it's going to be different from the one I drew before, which is a closed circuit. An open circuit means that you get to a point, there is an opening, you have to leave a space, draw it up, then connect it to your battery. So this time around, it's not just a straight line that we drew before, because it's an open circuit. Is an instruction, so you have to follow it that way. Now, if you do that, you are going to end because each of these, each of these questions, they have their different mark. So, if you fail to draw the first one, you move to the second, one, you may have lost.
two marks, which is a whole lot in physics. Half mark in physics is very important to us, so we take note of all of them. Now, after you have drawn that, the second question says, calculate effective capacitance in the circuit, which is also very easy. Effective capacitance talks about the total capacitance in the circuit. And the formula, you write the formula first. Formula first. And the formula is 1 over C is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. Now, after you have written your formula, correct substitution is the next step. How you are able to substitute correctly? Because these are the different steps we follow when marking questions on, in YX, when we are marking questions. So formula first, correct substitution, the final answer. That's what we look out for. So what is the correct substitution? 1 over C is equal to 1 over 8 plus 1 over 12 plus 1 over 24. So when you look for the LCM of all of them, at the end of the day, C will give you 4 microfarad. That's for B, that's the second question. Now the third question says, on closed circuit, calculate the charge on each capacitor when fully charged. Now if you look at it, it says calculate the charge on each capacitor. This is where you have to be very careful because most times they confuse us with the question. Now if you remember I said when capacitors are arranged in series, the same charge is established. Now look at the question, say calculate the charge on each. Now so many students will, will not be able to, if you don't, if you are not careful, you'll be carried away with the question and you just do something else, you just, and you think you are doing the right thing. At the end of the day, you begin to say, ah, why are they wicked and all that? No, it's not like that. The, this question is just to confuse you. When they say each capacitor, you note in your mind that capacitors arranged in series, the same charge is established. So how do we get that? Q, which is C, V. Q is equal to C, V. Now what is the C? The effective capacitance. Remember, we've already calculated for the effective capacitance from the second question, which is 4 microfarad. Now, you come down to substitute correctly. Q equal to, you are not going to write 4, as the case may be. Remember, I said all calculations are based on the SI unit. Now, the SI unit of capacitance is in farad, not microfarad. That's why I gave other units and how you can convert it earlier on. So 4 microfarad, writing it here now, you now write 4 times 10 raised to the minus 6. Writing it at 4 times 10 raised to the minus 6, you have converted to farad. Times V, the V from the question is 90. Is 90. So if you multiply through, you get Q equal to 360 micro colon or 3.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 4 colon. Then you go on to say that since the capacitors are in series, the charges are the same, which means the charge on uh, 8 microfarad is equal to the charge on 12 microfarad and is also equal to the charge on 24 microfarad, which is equal to 360 microfarad. All right, the last question says determine the PD across the 8 microfarad. Now, they didn't say determine the PD across the circuit. They say across the 8 microfarad. If you remember also, I said that when uh, capacitors are arranged in series, different voltage or PD is established. Now, we are asked to calculate the PD across the 8 microfarad. So, we'll concentrate on the PD across the 8 microfarad. Remember, looking at the formula Q equal to CV, making V subject of the formula, you have Q over C. So the V here is V8 microfarad, which is equal to Q over the capacitance, C8 microfarad, which is, charge has been calculated as 360, and the capacitance is 8. So if you evaluate, you get V equal to 45 volts. So maybe in our next class, we'll tackle those questions. But meanwhile, go back and digest the question and attempt it.
Her name again is Mrs. Esonye ID. Today we are going to be talking about rubber and plastics. I go with plastic first. Plastics are non-metallic and non-organic materials which are obtained mainly from petroleum. They are molded under high temperature to produce products which we see around us. You can see some of the pictures of plastic products. We have jerry cans, we have buckets, we have our bowls, plates that we use at home and for other uh, assignments. So the main components of plastic are cellulose, coal and petroleum. Cellulose, coal and petroleum. Now we have two types of plastics. We have the thermoset plastic and we have the thermoplastic. Thermoset plastic and the thermoplastic. So in short, we call them thermosets and thermoplasts. How do we know which is which? The thermoplastics are plastics which can melt on heating and flow as liquid and as such they can be remolded into different shapes thermoplastics they can be uh, melted when heated and they can be remolded why the thermosets can burn like firewood and so cannot be remolded. Now, the thermoplastics are used for products like jerry cans, your water cans, uh, bowls, plates, and other wares like we saw on our pictures before. And then the thermosets are used for materials like your electric fittings. You see your switch, your lamp holder, and some parts of your vehicles are made from thermosets. Examples are PVC, which is polyvinyl chloride. Those are thermoplastic. Polyvinyl chloride, nylon, and creolite are examples of thermoplastics or thermoplasts. Why thermosets? Examples are phenol formaldehyde, polyester resin, epoxide, bakelite. These are used for making items such as the buttons on your clothing, switches, and other electrical accessories, ceiling roses. These are all thermosets. And like I said earlier, they don't melt, but they burn when they have a heat. Properties of plastic. They are insulators, which means they are poor conductors of heat and electricity. That is why they are so useful in the electrical industries. They are transparent which means we can see through them. That is why we use them mostly for shield and sunglasses. They are flexible. You can easily bend them into shape. They have low density. That is what makes it more useful than other metals which are heavy in some, in some of our home appliances. Color. They, are, they can easily retain color for a very long time. That is what makes plastic attractive. Like you can see the wheels we showed before. They are of different colors. You have red, you have blue, you have pink. Then, they are resistant to corrosion. Remember when we talked about iron? We said iron can easily corrode. But plastics are resistant to corrosion. This is why they can be used for underground pipes for our water. 
and storage tanks. We use them for our chairs and tables because of their resistance. Now, let us look at some of the utensils in our homes. Can you name some of them? You have your buckets. You have your sieves. You have your bowls. You have your, your spoons. You have your takeaway packs. All these are products of plastic. You also have your bedroom fittings. They are all made up of plastic. In the electrical industry, they are used to insulate wires. They are used in electrical fittings. In automobile, they are used for car bumpers. They are used for shock absorbers. They are used in our building. Some parts of our building are made up of plastic materials. In advertisements, most of our billboards are made up of plastic because of their ability to retain color. We use them for screen writing and for sign writing. We also use them as shield. Some of our window shields are made up of rubber. These are some of, are made up of plastic. These are some of the uses of plastic. Now we are going to talk about rubber. Rubber is an organic material and it is non-metallic. It can stretch and compress back to its original shape. It is elastic. Rubber products include tire, tubes, car bumper, rain boots, raincoat, sandal shoes, the soles of most of our shoes, hand gloves, to mention a few. We also have two types of rubber. We have the natural rubber, which we get from the back of the rubber tree. The white fluid which comes out of the back of the rubber tree when you scratch it is called the rubber latex. When it is processed, it is used in most of the things we see around us. Rubber is made from the latex of rubber tree. That is why we call it natural. Then we have the synthetic rubber. The synthetic rubber is an artificial form of rubber, which is gotten from a mixture of components from petroleum. It also has some properties of the natural rubber, but not completely so. That is why there are some products which you cannot use the uh, artificial rubber to produce. Things like hand gloves, things like the teeth of your baby feeder, things like condom, things like your calendars that you use to clean your foot as you enter your home. All these are products of natural rubber. Your tire, your, your tube in your vehicles, all these are products of natural rubber. Even the balls that you play is a product of natural rubber. When you bake rubber with some materials, you get your football. Now, what are the properties? Like I said, rubber can stretch and bounce back to its original shape. And this is one quality that it has that makes it suitable as shock absorber. Rubbers can float on top of water. That is why it is used to build the body of ships and boats. Rubber is water resistance. That is, it does not allow the passage of water. It is an insulator. That means it's a poor conductor. Let's look at some of their uses. Like I said, football is a product of natural rubber. The soles of your slippers and shoes, your catapult, your balloons, the hose that you use to fetch water in your house. You have your tube and tire, the shock absorbers in your car and engines, your electrical insulator, your gloves, 
parts of your building, the parts, uh, the, the parts of your boats and ships are all made of rubber. Now, to round up this section, <coughs> we have talked about plastics and rubber. Some of their properties look alike, why they also differ in some parts. Like we said, plastics are not natural. Why we have natural and synthetic rubber. And then the natural rubber is gotten from the latex from the rubber tree. And when it is processed, it is used for the various items that we have displaced. We are displayed on the screen. As a follow up on that, we are going to look at some other resources. This time we are going to look at other resources from living things. What are resources? They are useful materials obtained from plants and animals. That is why we call them natural. We can generally group the resources that come from plants into food, crop, food crops, cash crops, industrial crops, medicinal crops, wood crops. Now food, we are familiar with our vegetables like the spinach, your water leaf, your bitter leaf, your cabbage, cucumber, all these are vegetables. We have fruits, oranges, mangoes, cashew, lemon, Purple, all these are fruits. We have seeds and grains, like rice, beans, sorghum, millet, and the rest. We have roots and tubers, yams, cassava, carrot, and the rest. We have oil plants, coconut oil, granite oil, palm oil, shea butter. Then, industrial plants, we have some plants that are used for cosmetics. Parts of them, like there's a wood they call the cow wood. When you, you scrub the surface of the cow wood, it produces a reddish dye, which has ability of protecting the skin and is used for beautification. So most com uh, cosmetic industries use extract from this cow wood. There's another vegetable they call lali in, in a Hausa language. It is used in those days to dress a bride. And this present age, they have converted them into different cosmetic products for our use. Industrially, we have bakeries making use of maize, sorghum, wheat, for their products, making use of yeast. We also know that maize, sorghum, and the other grains like mat are used for our beverage industries. Now let's look at what we can get from animal. We also have some resources from animal. First, we can use animal for food. Like we have our cow, we have our poultry, we have our dairy products, we also have fish. All these are resources that can either be used for food or for industrial purposes. They serve as raw material for other industrial products. We also have hides and skin. There are some animals that we don't necessarily eat, but their skin are useful. They get them, make them into beautiful colorations for foot mats, for uh, tooth in the house, decorations on our walls. They are all resources. Now let's look at the economic importance of these resources. We have said that we have cash crops. When you have cash crops, as you make sales, it increases the financial uh, uh, capacity 
of the owner or even the nation that has it. That is why Nigeria has some reserves. They call some game reserve where animals are kept, not just for eating, but for sightseeing. People come from other nations to come and watch these animals in their natural state and they pay money and it brings about uh, resources to Nigeria. We have recently, they had this Arugungu uh, ceremony where they watched people going to catch fish and the winner, the winner is the one that brings out the biggest fish. Those who came to watch, they pay money to do so and it's a form of uh, recreation. Apart from this, we have medicinal plants too. There are some plants that are very, very medicinal, like the neem. You can see the neem tree is all around us. You have it mostly in your school premises and some office premises. The neem, both the leaf and the seed are very, very medicinal. So those are the benefits that we have from these resources. Now, our wood resources, the chair you are sitting on now is made of wood. Our ceilings are made of wood. Some of our, but, uh, our parts of building, most of them, the doors, the fittings, even the roofing materials, before you cover it with your zinc or aluminum, are all from wood. And so they have so many benefits. Apart from the feeding, it also attracts a lot of financial resources to their owners and even to the nation as a whole. Now looking at the environmental importance. For example, we now have a lot of nations experiencing flood. But because of the presence of all these our woods, they help to reserve our land from excess flood. That is another advantage of our resources. Because these big timbers, they have big roots which can prevent the speed reduce the speed of water flow and even the speed of wind flow so that the rainstorm does not remove our roof or sweep away our nation. These are all advantages of these resources. Of course, we know that some of them are not within our reach. And so those who have it also transport it to those who don't have. It creates job for the person that is producing it, creates job for the one that is transporting it, and creates job for the one that is going to sell it. So that is another advantage of these natural resources. Again, we have, you know, to preserve some of these things before they can be transported. Also, so, those who preserve them, like freezing them or processing them, packaging them, it also creates job for them. So what have we said? Natural resources, apart from feeding us, create job, give us financial resources, gives us health, and it makes us better for it. Thank you.